Hello student, welcome to the lecture on documentation and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand export documentation, explain pro forma invoice, describe certificates of origin, discuss generalized system of preferences GSP, define commercial shipping bills, describe self declaration forms of SDF forms. Let's start with some introduction. Documentation is a general term that refers to the process and tools for collecting and recording information. A variety of documentation methods exist which employ visual and auditory components and which convey the relevance and meaning of the material that is collected. These include text, video, audio or a combination of media. Let us now discuss about export documentation. Export documentation is far more than just shipping words. It includes all of the important records of an international transaction using the correct trade terminology, clearly defining the transfer of interest and liability, selecting the right method of payment and sending the best quotation possible are the keys to effective exporting. After the sale has been made, proper and timely selection, preparation and distribution of documents are essential. Documents used in international trade are a reflection of the understanding of the agreement between the seller, the buyer and third party service and regulatory agencies. The term export documentation is actually a relative misnomer as most work is really being prepared on behalf of the buyer and is used for custom clearance and other legalities at the port of import and thus is really import documents. Documentation is needed to evidence compliance with the contract terms and facilitate customs clearance both import and export. This may seem a monotonous subject, but it becomes more manageable if split into categories determined by the question, who needs what? At the minimum, you may need no documents at all, whereas at maximum, you may need several documents, including Specific certificates issued by authorised bodies such as the Chamber of Commerce. It is important to know what you need for every dispatch and to communicate it clearly within your organisation so that all the paperwork comes together at the right time. Documentation is needed to comply with the order or contract so that you get paid promptly and to meet import regulations in the destination country so that the goods are cleared from the port efficiently, avoiding any penalties or charges. You will also need to ensure that you comply with all the necessary legal requirements. Getting it right first time will save you money and prevent penalties for non-compliance. Finally, it is a legal requirement for all exporters to retain export paperwork for at least six years. The Chamber's international trade team is one of the leading providers of export documentation services to the business community. The team provides advice on worldwide export documentation requirements and trade regulations. The range of documentation available to exporters is European certificates of origin facilitate trade between community member states and the rest of the world. These are used for several reasons. Logistical reasons, actually moving the goods, packing reasons, legal reasons, to meet UK, European Union and international law requirements, political and security reasons, including anti-terrorism, ecological and health reasons, to prevent the spread of disease and infestation, financial and payment reasons, perhaps the main reasons for exporting. ECERT is an electronic version of European Certificates of Origin. Using eCert, you can apply electronically for European Certificates of Origin directly via the internet, in addition to submitting documents through the Chamber's network of offices. Arab British Certificates of Origin, which are essential documents for exports to a range of Middle Eastern countries and are supported by a legalisation service. eCert is an electronic version of Arab British Certificates of Origin. ATR EUR1 certificate establish the customs duty status of goods that qualify for preference when goods are exported to countries that have preferential trade arrangements with the European Union, 
So you would need one of these when exporting goods over a certain value within the EU and other preferential countries, such as Norway, Switzerland, Turkey and Morocco. If you are taking goods and samples for display at exhibitions or need to transport specialised tools and equipment to complete specific work overseas, then you will need an ATA carnet. These facilitate the temporary export of goods for up to 12 months, acting as a passport when presented at each customs post. They are recognised in 38 countries worldwide and enable goods to be temporarily imported into a country without the need to pay duties. The requirements and procedures involved when trading internationally can often be complex and time-consuming, and if done incorrectly, the repercussions can be high and costly, as I highlighted earlier. Let us now move to our next topic, pro forma invoice. The pro forma invoice is usually the first export document prepared. It is generated by the exporter in response to an opportunity for export business, often from a trade lead, whether from an unsolicited direct inquiry or as follow-up from a trade event. Virtually nothing is accomplished in an export transaction without the insurance and acceptance of a pro forma invoice. Pro forma invoices can be either formal or informal documents depending on the requirements of the destination country. A pro forma invoice is a snapshot of the offer as it stands at the moment. The seller should carefully develop the quote because once the buyer accepts the offer to sell at a certain price, a formal contract for the exact amount exists. A pro forma invoice is a preliminary bill of sale sent to buyers in advance of a shipment or delivery of goods. Typically, it gives a description of the purchased items, notes the cost, as well as other important information like shipping weight and transport charges. Pro forma invoices are often used for customs purposes on imports. A pro forma invoice differs from a simple price quotation in that it is usually considered a binding agreement, despite the fact that, like a price quote, the terms of sale are subject to change. Pro forma invoices are used by a wide variety of businesses in virtually all industries. Commercial invoice and its attestation. The commercial invoice is considered to be the most important international trade document and should be prepared as accurately as possible. It is the main document used by customs to accept or reject the custom entry prepared by the custom broker. Even with a sample shipment, a commercial invoice is required and needs to state the fact that the goods are not for resale, are samples only and have little commercial value. The commercial invoice should reflect the exact nature and terms of the agreement that exists between the buyer and the seller. Most duties are applied at an 8 value ram rate which are on the value of the goods upon their arrival, usually CIF. Cost, insurance and freight. The invoice would be totaled to that amount and the duties paid accordingly, so it is key in most custom clearances. Often the commercial invoice will be prepared by the seller and totaled to the desired trade term, then depending on the method of payment submitted through banking channels or sent directly to the importer for payment. These arrangements need to be agreed upon between the seller and the freed forwarder prior to the shipping the goods. Although there is no standard form for a commercial invoice, the following information should be included. Seller's name and address, buyer's name and address, exact description of goods, kind, grade, quality, weight, agreed upon price in US dollar in order to reduce foreign exchange risk, description of packages, number, kind, markings, dimension, type of container, delivery point, terms of payment, date and place of shipment, method of shipment, signature of shipper or seller. Parties to the transaction and the commercial invoice. The parties involved in the export transaction that need an original or copy of the document underscores the importance of the commercial invoice. They are the exporter, as a record of the shipment and the payment mechanism. The importer, also a record of shipment and payment mechanism. The freight for word. Users invoice in part to prepare the documentation they provide as part of their services. The custom broker uses the invoice to prepare the custom entry forms at the point of import. The packing list. The packing list is used by custom to apply certain types of duties and is a required document for custom clearance. Most duties are applied on a basic of value known as ad valorine duties and the commercial invoice is key for those. 
There are also two other types of duties apply to imports, specific and compound. Specific duties require the packing list as they are applied on the physical nature of the goods, such as their pieces, weight or measure and this information comes from the packing list. Compound duties are applied as both ad valorant and specific tariffs together and thus both the commercial invoice and packing list would be required for custom clearance. It is also used by shipping companies to identify the weight and dimension of product and should be completed in metric form. It does not usually require any value for the merchandise but a very complete list of all the products, their packing, example cartons, boxes, crates, barrels, bags, their gross and net weight, their cubic feet and cubic meters and any markings or handling issues. Let us now study about certificates of origin. The certificate of origin is used by a neutral third party to identify the origin of manufacture of the good. The origin of manufacture, not the origin of export, is important to determine the proper duties to be applied by the customs at the destination. Many chambers of commerce in areas around ports of export sell and prepare the certificate of origin or allow local freight forwarders to do so on their behalf. Some countries have specific certificates of origin, but many will allow the general use certificate to satisfy their requirements. Shipments paid by letters of credit may require one as mandated by the issuing bank. The certificate of origin will need to be prepared exactly to the letter of credit requirements. NAFTA Certificate of Origin Customer Form 434 or the NAFTA Certificate of Origin, as it is commonly known, is uniform in all three countries and printed in Spanish, French and English. At the exporter's discretion, it can be completed in the language of the origin or destination country. Importers shall submit a translation of the certificate to their own customer administration when requested. An understanding of the harmonized system HS and the NAFTA rules of origin are imperative for an exporter to legally and correctively prepare the documents. The HS number for each product needs to be placed on the NAFTA certificate of origin. This document must be completed and signed by the manufacturer of or the exporter of the goods where the exporter is not the producer of the goods. The exporter may complete the certificate on the basic of knowledge that the product originates on the NAFTA, reasonable reliance on the producer written representation that the good originates, a completed and signed certificate of origin for the good voluntary providing, to the exporting company by the producer. A NAFTA certificate of origin is not required for shipments to Mexico or Canada. The exporter should only prepare a NAFTA certificate if the product qualifies for preferential tariff treatment under the NAFTA rules of origin. Export inception and certification. The various steps involved in export inception and certification of plans and planned products are registration of application. The exporter or his agent shall submit an application in duplicate to officer in charge of concerned PQ station at the designated port through which he tends to export or to the concerned inspecting and certifying authority notified wide notification 897 by 91 pp.i dated 26 November 1993 issued by the Ministry of Agriculture as to produce sufficiently in advance or at least two to three days prior to the actual date of shipment of consignment. Inception or sampling and laboratory testing. The exporter or his agent shall present the consignment either at the office of PQ station or arrange for inception at his premises or present the containers at any other approved place on scheduled date and time of inception as per the quarantine order issue. The exporter or his agent shall provide necessary transport, labor and other facilities for opening, sampling, repacking, sealing, etc. The Shipper's Export Declaration The Shipper's Export Declaration is required on shipments valued greater than INR 1,25,000 per Schedule B number or shipments regardless of value of goods requiring permission from the US government to sell outside the US that is export licenses and shipment to certain countries regardless of value. The loan exception to the requirement is for exports to Canada that are not on an export license and terminating there. The U.S. obtains its export data for Canada from Canadian Customs. The export declaration is a form designed and approved by the Bureau of Census and is used to collect census information regarding exports. In a typical export transaction, most exports agree that there will be more than 30 documents exchanged. Uh, you might not see many of the documents uh, because a few are exchanged between the banks, uh, the shipping companies, 
uh, and other parties to the transaction. Uh, let's start with the sales contract. Uh, one of the most important uh, commercial document, it's an agreement between the exporter and the importer uh, that specifies all the terms and conditions of the transaction. Uh, export declaration uh, required by exporters country uh, declaring goods to be exported, uh, where they will be exported, who will receive them, uh, the harmonized uh, schedule number, uh, the schedule B number, uh, the price and other uh, government requirements will be uh, identified in that document. Uh, export license, uh, some countries require for a specific product and others require for all goods uh, that will be exported from the country. Uh, Prepare my invoice, uh, a form of uh, quotation, uh, sent uh, in advance to the commercial invoice uh, from the exporter to the uh, importer. A commercial invoice, however, is a bill uh, from the exporter to the importer for uh, a payment. A bill of lading and airway bill are agreements uh, between the exporter and the transportation company uh, to deliver the uh, goods to the uh, consignee. A certificate of origin uh, required by some countries uh, verifies the origin of the product to be shipped. Uh, insurance certificate uh, is a policy that will uh, cover the loss or damage of goods during uh, shipment. Uh, a packing list is an itemized list of goods, uh, including uh, identifying the number of packages that are being shipped. Uh, inspection certificate uh, required by some countries or by some importers as well, uh, that uh, verifies the uh, specification of goods uh, and including uh, the Price. Uh, remember that uh, exporting is all about uh, documents. Uh, make sure uh, you identify all the uh, required documents uh, uh, before. Generalized System of Preferences GSP. The EU's Generalized System of Preferences GSP allows developing country exporters to pay lower duties on their exports to the EU. This gives them vital access to EU markets and contributes to their economic growth. The reform GSP, which will apply as from 2014, will further focus support on countries most in need. Generalized system of preferences in a nutshell. There are three main variants arrangement of the system. The standard GSP system, which offers generous tariff reduction to developing countries. Practically, this means partial or entire removal of tariffs on two-thirds of all product categories. The GSP plus enhanced preferences mean full removal of tariffs on essentially the same product categories as those covered by the general arrangement. These are granted to countries which ratify and implement international conventions relating to human and labor rights, environment and good governance. EU trade and generalized system of preferences. Main features of the reform GSP. Concentrating GSP preferences on countries most in need, a number of countries which do not require GSP preferences to be competitive will no longer benefit from the system as from 1st January 2014, including countries that already have preferential access to the EU, which is at least as good as under GSP. For example, under a free trade agreement or a special autonomous trade regime, Countries which have achieved a high or upper middle income per capita based on World Bank classification. A number of overseas countries and territories which have an alternative market access arrangement for developed markets. Reinforcing the incentives for the respect of core human and labor rights, environmental and good governance standards to the GSP plus arrangement. Strengthen the effectiveness of the trade concession for least developed countries to the everything but armed system. Reducing GSP to fewer beneficiaries will reduce competitive pressure and make the preferences for LDCs more meaningful. Global System of Trade Preferences GSDP The agreement establishing the Global System of Trade Preferences GSDP among developing countries was signed on 13 April 1988 at Belgrade following conclusion of the first round of negotiation. The agreement entered into force on 19 April 1989. 44 countries have ratified the agreement and have become participants. The GSTP establishes a framework for the exchange of trade concession among the members of the group of 77. It lays down rules, principles and procedures for conduct of negotiation and for implementation of the result of the negotiation. 
In order to carry forward the exchange of concession, the second round of GSTP negotiation was launched in 1991. During the second round, India held bilateral negotiation for exchange of concession with 12 countries. These concessions have not been implemented so far. In the 16th section of the GSTP Committee of Participants COP held in Geneva on 10 December 2003, the committee decided to constitute an ad hoc technical working group amongst other issues to comprehensively review the operations of GSTP agreement and study the technical feasibility of the possible means of invigorating and furthering the objectives of the GSTP agreement. The recommendation of the technical working group for a new round of negotiation were accepted by the committee of participants and in the special ministerial session of the committee of participants held in Sao Paulo during UNCTAD 11 on 16 June 2004. The ministers decided to launch a third round of negotiation under the GSTP. As per the decision taken therein, a negotiating committee will commence negotiations in November 2004 and conclude the negotiation by not later than November 2006. Commercial Shipping Bills Now coming over the shipping bills. Shipping bills are defined as free shipping bill. When a shipper does not want to claim any export benefit, a free shipping billing is to be filed for shipments. Drawback shipping bill. Whenever the shipper wants to claim drawback as an export benefit, a drawback shipping bill is to be filed for shipments. The shipper must have a valid account with the SBI Air Cargo Complex, which will enable him to file drawback shipping bills at custom EDI system. DEP B. Shipping Bill Duty Entitlement Passbook Scheme If a shipper is exporting an item, the rate of which is fixed under DEPB for the serial number of item being exported, the following documents are required to be submitted. Duly filled, signed by shipper and stamp with company seal, purchase bill or AR4, form for value verification, Difference between shipping build and GR once after preparing commercial invoice, packing list and other documents for export documentation for custom clearance procedure, the shipper either files documents directly with custom department or appoint a custom broker to file export documents on behalf of shipper. As any goods moving out of country need to be approved by custom by mandatory filing of a legal document called shipping bill. Shipping bill contains all required details about the goods plan to export. The shipping bill also reflects the scheme of export whether free bill, drawback, DEEC, DEPB, DFRC, EPCG or under any other benefited scheme. The shipper of his customer broker signed with rubber stamp the declaration of shipping bill as specified by customs authorities. If the cargo is filed at a custom location where an electronic data interchange facility is available, such shipping bill is filed by electronic means as per the specified format of software. Once after filing of such shipping bill in quadruplicate with extra copies under certain schemes in quantuplicate, the custom authorities admit shipping bill and necessary assessment and examination procedures are carried out. After completion of all export procedure and formalities, a lead export order is issued on shipping bill duly signed and sealed by custom officials. After introduction of electronic data interchange facility, the manual hard copy GR procedures have been discontinued as a copy of GR is directly transmitted from customs department to reserve bank. However, GR procedure and export are continued at a customs location where in no electronic filling arrangements are available. The GR is not meant for custom but it is the property of Reserve Bank of India. So what is the importance of GR and why does Reserve Bank monitor GR? In an export trade, inward remittance from foreign countries affected and in an import trade money is transferred from importing country to a foreign country. For an economic stability of a country, all inward and outward movements of money have to be monitored and Reserve Bank is the government agency for the same. This is a reason for involvement of Reserve Bank on each export of country through monitor of GR. Mates received. A document originally issued by the first mate of the ship, 
he was the officer responsible for cargo. The document would be issued by him after the cargo was tallied into the ship by tally clock. The shipper or his representative would then take the mate's receipt to the master or the agent to exchange it for a bill of lading, which would incorporate any condition inserted into the mate's receipt. In modern days, the document known as a mate's receipt is not often signed by the mate of the ship but by some person in the shore office of the shipping company or its agent, although the name of the document remains the same. Self-declaration forms or SDF forms the self-declaration form is a form in which we ask to declare any criminal warnings, cautions and convictions that may have and to agree to keep us informed of any subsequent warnings, cautions or conviction. It also provides the institution with consent for applicants who have signed up for the DPS update service. If a conviction is indicated, please provide in a sealed envelope a letter detailing explaining the content and circumstances of the conviction or caution in order to assist with the processing of application. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. Documents used in international trade are a reflection of the understanding of the agreement between the seller, the buyer and third party service and regulatory agencies. The commercial invoice should reflect the exact nature and terms of the agreement that exists between the buyer and the seller. The origin of manufacture, not the origin of export, is important to determine the proper duties to be applied by customs at the destination. The exporter or his agent shall present the consignment either at the office of PQ station or arrange for inspection at his premises or present the containers at any other approved place on scheduled date and time of inception as per the guaranteed order issued. The information on the mate's receipt is usually checked against the information and description of the goods as furnished by the shipper, particularly when the shipper prepares the bill of lading document for signature by or for the carrier. The bills of lading are usually required to be issued in accordance or in conformity with the mate's receipt and or the tally clerk's receipt. Sometimes the document that is issued by the agents of the carrier fulfills the function of the mate's receipt but is called the dock receipt.